Welcome to Kiffin's Keep, an intellectual resource for the pillar and buttress of the truth, which is the church. This is a project of the London Lyceum, which is all about serious thinking for a serious church. I'm Jordan Stefaniak, president of the London Lyceum and host of Kiffin's Keep. And as always, I'm excited to be here with you all today. In today's episode, I'm going to be covering the topic of lying and whether it's moral to ever do it or not. Before we get into the video, remember to like the video if you enjoyed the content, subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any of the great quality content that we're producing, and also go ahead and comment if you agree or disagree. I imagine that there's going to be some disagreement on this episode, so I imagine you should drop a comment below and tell me why you think I'm wrong, or maybe you think I'm right, and you can put that in there because that's cool and fun and nice. Now, Let's get into the topic. So the reason I'm bringing up the topic of lying is just because, well, it's being discussed in the internet interwebs. So I guess what what happened, so Matt Walsh, that's the guy's name, Daily Wire or whatever, he did some documentary, and I don't have all the facts on this. I don't really care about the facts on this. Um, It's just more of a launching pad of why this discussion is happening. The discussion is happening because apparently – he was deceptive to people in this documentary in order to convince them to do the documentary because otherwise they wouldn't have done it or maybe we think they wouldn't have done it. And so there's been some backlash to that. We have some people like Denny Burke who wrote an article for World, which I was a little surprised they published this, but they did saying that lying is a sin and that Matt Walsh shouldn't have done that. And he is getting just absolutely brutalized on the internet. So if you're not on the internet, good for you. If you are, you've probably seen it. And the reality is that 75% of these accounts that are saying stuff are just anonymous accounts. So they're just cowardly liars themselves anyway, probably. That's not true for all anonymous accounts, but it's true for probably 95% of them. Sorry, not sorry. Um, But it's interesting that there's a significant coalition of people that are really pushing back on this and saying, here's all the exception cases, here's all the reasons that lying can be virtuous and righteous, the Bible paints lying as virtuous and righteous, and et cetera, which I think is ludicrous um, for a couple of reasons. So number one, uh, I think the the reason that lying, well, maybe we need to get clear on what lying is. So lying is sort of like deceptively, it's this, here, I'm going to pull something. Because this is a nice little definition of it. In in Christian Miller's, I don't keep book cover, so sorry you can't see that. But he gives an account here in his book called Honesty. I think this is Oxford University Press. And let's see, where is his account? I should have had it here for you guys. But I'll just take another second to say that it's a good, very good, valuable book to to sort of understand the landscape of what is honesty and what is lying. And it, it's important to to distinguish here. There's a there's the topic of whether lying is a sin, with or is always a sin, or if there's if it's context dependent, and then the question of the virtue of honesty and the virtue and the vice of dishonesty. So I take it that on an Aristotelian framework, which I accept, virtues and vices are more of degrees, and more of things of consistency. So there is a sense in which you can lie once and still have the virtue of honesty, whereas you can be honest once and still have the vice of dishonesty. So they're they're more of a degreed phenomenon, and not just not just talking about discrete actions um, apart from the the aggregate. So this is the way that Christian Miller de- describes the virtue of honesty. He says the virtue of honesty is the virtue of being disposed centrally and reliably to not intentionally distort the facts as the agent sees them. So that's a fine definition. Um, where they're lying would then be sort of like this intentionally distorting of the facts as the agent sees them. So this gets you off the hook for all the different scenarios where you were distorting the facts, but you had no idea you were distorting the facts. So say um, I got a text from my friend saying that the Jaguars won against the Browns, which they should have. They didn't. And it's very frustrating and sad that they didn't. But let's just say they told me that. And this is a reliable friend. So I just assume it's true. And then I start broadcasting that. Find out it's, it's false. I'm not lying because I didn't I didn't know that. I thought what I was telling I was telling the truth as far as I was concerned. And so while that that's that's not lying simpliciter. So the question that we want to discuss is lying again. So is is lying a sin? Is there a discrete action there when you distort the facts intentionally? Is that a sin? And let's first start with what Jesus says. Jesus says the devil is a liar and he's the father of lies. And so Big text right there you find in John, and Jesus is saying that 
lies more than anything else describe who the devil is. I don't think I want to be associated with that. You go to different texts in Colossians and Ephesians where Paul is very clear, put away every type of falsehood from you, tell the truth, speak the truth always. So when we look at these different texts in the scripture, it seems there's very clear blanket statements on tell the truth. The Ten Commandments. The Ninth Commandment is to not bear false witness. Do not lie. Those are just simple, clear, authoritative facts. And if you want to go further into the Reformed tradition, which the Reformed tradition is almost completely unanimous on, on how they think about lying and its, and its relationship to whether, it, whether it's sin. And a lot of, most of them are just following Augustine in this. So Augustine is very influential, his work on lying. Let's look at the, the Westminster Larger Catechism. I'm not going to read the whole thing because the answer to this is huge. But in question 145, it asks, what are the sins forbidden in the Ninth Commandment? And it goes through a whole list of things that are forbidden there. And, you know, it's just detracting, whispering, scoffing, reviling, rash, harsh, and, and partial censuring, all, all, all sorts of things, flattering, thinking, or speaking too, too highly or too meanly of ourselves or others, denying the gifts of, and graces of God, hiding, excusing, or extenuating sins. I mean, it, it's a huge list. And included in that is not telling the truth or concealing the truth or having undue silence and just cause or, or, or all sorts of things like that. You get the same sort of answer about what is forbidden in the Ninth Commandment according to the Heidelberg Catechism in question uh, 112. And that's to, to never give false witness testimony against anyone, to twist no one's words, to not gossip or slander, to not nor join in condemning anyone rashly or without a hearing. Rather, in court and everywhere else, we should avoid lying and deceit of every kind. There's no exceptions here. These are the devices the devil uses, and they would, they would call down on me God's intense wrath. I should love the truth, speak it candidly, and openly acknowledge it, and I should do what I can to guard, and I should do what I can to guard and advance my neighbor's good name. Period. Doesn't give us an exception clause. It doesn't give us any, any reason to doubt that there's any sort of reason that there would be a righteous telling of the falsehoods. And you get the same sort of answer ac across the tradition. Even You even have, you pull, pull out Scotus, and he's going to say, the view that everyone holds on this question is that lying is a sin. And he's going to quote, or he's going to cite Bonaventure, Thomas, Henry of Ghent, William of Auxerre, Richard Milton, a bunch of others. And he's clear that what always comes up are these problem cases, okay? So you have Rahab, who's who's apparently, you know, Hebrews 11 Hall of Faith. She's praised for her faith. And you have the Hebrew midwives. What do you do about that? They deceive. Therefore, there must be sort of some sort of category for righteous lying. But across the Reformed tradition and across, I think, most uh, of the Christian tradition, not everybody, but mo definitely the vast majority of the Reformed tradition. Um, and it's important to... I'll, I'll get there when I get there. Let's just, let's start here. Scoda says, there's no need to recommend Rahab and the midwives for lying because they aren't commended for it in scripture. When you look at Hebrews 11, when you look at other, those other texts where they're praising the, the works of the midwives or Rahab, they are not praised for lying. They're praised for their trust in God. And so the solution is supposed to be, yes, they sinned, but it was a lesser sin compared to the good act that they did. And yes, all of our good works are sort of mixed with, with bad things. I mean, this is what you get in Calvin and, and on his commentary on Exodus, he talks about how um, some assert that this, this kind of lie, which they call the lie of officious or serviceable. And that's, I mean, you find that in the medieval period and everywhere else, they've got these three categories of lies, which we can talk about in a moment. They're going to say that it's not reprehensible because they think there's no fault where no deceit for the purpose of injury is used. But Calvin says, but I hold that whatever is opposed to the nature of God is sinful. And on this ground, all dissimulation, whether in word or deed is condemned as I shall more largely discuss and explain the law. Wherefore, both points must be admitted that the two women lied. And since lying is displeasing to God, they sinned. For as in estimating the conduct of saints, we should be just and humane interpreters. So also superstitious zeal must be avoided in covering their faults since this would often infringe on the direct authority of Scripture. And indeed, when whensoever the faithful fall into sin, they desire not to be lifted out of it by false defenses for their justification, consists in a simple and free demand of pardon for their sin. I mean, this is good stuff. Nor is there any contradiction to this in the fact that they are twice praised for their fear of God and that 
God is said to have rewarded them because in his paternal indulgence of his children, he still values their good works as if they were pure, notwithstanding they may be defiled by some mixture of impurity. In fact, there is no action so perfect as to be absolutely free from stain, though it may appear more evidently in some than in others. And he goes on to explain the same exact case with Rachel and her the, the good desire that she had um, for the promises of God, but her, her failure to follow through what, what would be a righteous achieving of that, of that deed or whatever it is. You get this very clearly in Turretin, who explains lies. I mean, he explains lies require two things, the enunciation of be something false. And then there's a will of enunciating what is false, and so the speech be contrary to the thought. And I think that just sort of tracks with what Christian said. And he gives these those three categories of lies, where it's the sort of the the let me see, where does he call them? The the pernicious lie, right? So the one that that's everybody sort of agrees that that's bad. There's one that's going to hurt somebody intentionally. The the lie of humor or amusement. So the sort of like the telling a joke or or for some reason to lie or the officious, which is intended to be or promote the benefits of somebody else. So it's the classic Nazi at the doors, the Rahab, the midwives sort of lie. And concerning the first, everybody agrees it's a sin. But concerning the last two, there is a mixture of opinion, particularly in the medieval period uh, among the papists. And then you get to the reform period as the reformed understand moral uh, theory develops. They are very clear uh, that they consider all of these true sins condemned by the law of God. That's what Turretin says. Lying everywhere is condemned in Scripture as a sin abominable to God. And therefore, all different categories of lies are sinful. And he follows Augustine in, do, in saying this, and he follows others. And he quotes these others. So he, he says, whatever we read of having been done by holy men is not forthwith to be imitated as if lawful. That's the mistake that often happens. So you get these different examples and you say, look at these descriptions. Therefore, these must be the righteous ways to live. And he says, no, 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 no. That's not how this works. Just because someone did something and is rewarded doesn't mean that they should be commended for the entire acts of what they did. That's nonsense. God didn't bless Jacob for lying. He, he, that's that's not how that works. You get the same sort of logic in, in Herman Bovink. And Herman Bovink is so strong to say this. He says, the Reformed accepted the distinctions among the kinds of lies, like we mentioned here, the three different kinds. But he held all forms of lying, but, but, but the Reformed held all forms of lying to be sinful. All forms of lying, the Reformed held this to be sinful. And he's going to cite uh, quite a few uh, different Reformed divines there. Um, go find his Reformed Ethics, I think it's volume two, and you can see that there. And then you have, and, and I like to call him the Bav Daddy. Now you have uh, Gill, John Gill, the, the great frowner of all, all frowns, and but he's the great Baptist divine. And he says in the Ninth Commandment that it forbids all lying, which is speaking contrary to a man's mind and conscience and with a design to deceive, and so condemns all sorts of lies, whether these three, and he goes through these three three categories, they're, it doesn't matter what they are, whether they're mental reservations, their perjury, every false oath, bearing a false witness, and, and subordination of false witnesses in a court of, of judicature, they're all against they're all against God's will. Period, and he says that the, that's what the ninth commandment forbids. Now you may come and say, you know what, all of these reform figures are wrong. Augustine's wrong, John Gill's wrong, Francis Turretin's wrong, John Calvin's wrong, Herman Bobbing's wrong. All of these thinkers are wrong. And you can find, I mean, you can find an example, an exception. Here's the only exception I've found so far. Now, I've not read every single reform thinker there is, so I'm, there's probably more of an ex, there's probably more exceptions. You have somebody like Peter Martyr Vermeule, who after extensively engaging Augustine, will say, I think in these emergency cases where if it's the choice of this person is killed or you lie, you, you'd go ahead and lie. He's still going to say that that lie is, is wrong, and yet it's the thing that you should do. I think everybody in this scenario, whether it's Calvin or whoever else, is probably going to say, if, if you are stuck in the situation because of sin, you are, and I think somebody shared a Luther quote with me, and it's sort of like, you do the lesser of the evils, even though it's still evil, then you repent and you ask God for forgiveness and you hope that you're never put in that situation again. I think that's appropriate. That's sort of the, the the reality. 
But you can't just pull these emergency contexts or wartime contexts or whatever and say, this is a paradigm for how we should think about lying. There are righteous acts of lying. No, 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 no. The scripture is unequivocally clear. Lying is sin. It's prohibited in the ninth commandment, period. And that's how all of our forefathers have understood the ninth commandment and have understood the rest of the New Testament and Old Testament and how it talks about telling the truth and, and what honesty and lying entails. It says you must speak the truth. If you don't speak the truth, you're not trustworthy. Those who come out and say you need to have all sorts of forms of lying, whatever the context, are going to justify lying in all sorts of contexts, and they're not trustworthy people. You can't build anything around, you can't build a neighborhood around people who are untrustworthy trustworthy in those ways. What I think our, our current day is showing is that we are surrounded by a bunch of liars who refuse to be absolutely committed to uh, honesty. Are we wiser than God? No, we're absolutely not. God says, do not lie, and we shouldn't lie. I think that's plainly obvious and plainly clear. And if Jesus is the truth, then we should be be committed to the truth, no matter the cost, and pray that the Lord would provide us a way out, wherever that is, if we're stuck in a situation in which there was truly death or lying, which I guarantee you 99.9999% of people will never be put in a situation where they can't tell the truth. It's just a matter of, do I protect my reputation? Do I protect my job? Or do I protect this or X, Y, Z? And you choose to tell the truth and trust the Lord, and he will vindicate and judge. Okay, that's my take on lying. I think it's it's universally uh, condemned as a sin. Um, there, I think there there's legitimate debate to be had. I mean, if you want to take a different position on lying, I understand. If you do it rationally and appropriately, I get it. Um, I think the virtue of honesty has much more latitude of, w- of what that contains, but the, the distinct, discreet act of a lie, is that a sin or not? I think you have to say, yes, it's a sin. How grave of a sin is it? Well, it depends on the context. It depends on the nature of the lie. If you lie to your child that you're out of candy because you don't want to give them any more candy, I think that's a far less pernicious lie that you're going to be judged for than something else, and yet it's still a sin. And I think that's just the way the Bible teaches. That's what the Bible teaches, and that's what our Reformed fathers and forefathers have have taught in their own ethics. And I think it's time that we retrieved a Reformed understanding of the Ninth Commandment. Yes, it's hard to swallow, but that a lot, there's a lot of things in, in, in the tradition that are hard to swallow. And you know what? They're probably smarter than we are. We're in a context where we think that lying's okay and appropriate. It's not. And we need to, to, to get on board with the reality that we have to tell the truth, no matter the cost. I, I, don't, I don't see any way around that. And, that, and the, the fact that telling the truth has suddenly become an effeminate practice is shocking to me. And I don't care if you want to say that you have a calm demeanor or whatever. You don't have a calm demeanor. You have a sinful demeanor, period. If you think that telling the truth is is effeminate, then you don't understand what the Scriptures teach. Telling the truth is the most strong-willed action that you can take, especially when it costs you something. That is true courage. That's what I've done a video on courage before, and I've talked about that. You know, it's telling the truth when it costs you something. And that that's just the fact of the matter. So I think you, you've just got to have this pretty strong absolutist view of when lying is appropriate and when it's not. Now, that's distinct, again, from the question of the virtue of honesty. So I'll, I'm going to recommend Christian Miller's book, Honesty. I'll try to put a, a link in the description so you can go get a copy of that if you want to think more about this topic. But again, I mean, you could pick up any number of Reformed systematic theologies and go find the section on the Ninth Commandment, and you're going to get a nice little exposition of what lying is. And August, some of Augustine's comments on this, because Augustine's extremely influential with his position of, you know, all lying is sinful and, and, and on. So hopefully this has been useful. I've been, I guess, a little bit more forceful than usual, but I, I'm very, very passionate about truth telling. I think it's extremely important, especially in our day and age. Uh, we, we can't have social trust in, in communities and in, in things beyond that without a resolute commitment to telling the truth. And I think Christians must be resolutely committed to telling the truth. So I've wrote an essay however long ago with the flamethrower stuff on it. And and part of that design was saying like, look, I, I continue to see more and more people in the Christian community sort of be okay with lying as long as it serves some sort of utilitarian better purpose. And it's, it's very, it's very, um, 
bad because it's this this slippery slope, honestly, where you start to justify more and more lies to get what you achieve, what you think is a better purpose, apart from God's design of telling the truth and being forthright and honest, and courageously and speaking the truth in all ways. And does that mean that sort of undercover investigative journalism is out? out? Well, it depends. Is it lying? Then yes, it is. That's wrong and sinful. Don't do it. Find another way to determine the truth. And that may be like, wow, that's really hard to take to swallow. Well, yeah, a lot of Jesus' sayings are hard to swallow, and we still have to do it. Maybe that's a sign that it's true. But what was I saying? So I, I wrote that essay because I just keep seeing more people just publicly, honestly saying, yes, lying is an appropriate act. It's a righteous act. And it's not. The, the, you don't find that in Scripture. You don't find that in the Reformed tradition. You don't find people saying all these things are righteous. They may find exceptions to these extreme emergency scenarios that none of us are in. And that seemed like it's just, it's it's bad news. So we need to be double down on our commitment to honesty and say, you know what, no matter the cost, I want to be an honest person. And that's what we should be committed to as Christians. Um, yeah, so I, I'd love to hear what you guys think. Do you think I'm wrong in this? Uh, maybe you do, and I'd appreciate you f- filling me in on what you think. As always, thanks for tuning in to Kiff and Skeep, and I look forward to thinking with you soon. Okay, so I'm actually back with a couple of additions. This is the benefit of recording your episodes well in advance. So you see things and you start to think of things and realize, man, I didn't cover all that I probably should have in that episode. And the reason I'm adding a couple things here is because I think there's some important factors that have arisen from this ongoing conversation, and I'm not going to add any more. So if I miss stuff, well, that's just the way it is. But there's three things that I wanted to bring up in relation to lying and what it constitutes and why it's always bad and why, well, let's just, let's cover these three things. So since I recorded that video, I've seen a couple of more responses. Um, One of them, I just want to be abundantly clear. I don't remember if I was in the original first half of this video that scripture never praises anyone for lying. So I've seen a lot of people when it comes to lying, they're going to give you examples like I've already covered Rahab, the midwives, et cetera, praised. Well, in scripture, yes, they're praised, but they're not praised for lying. You will never find anywhere in scripture where anybody's praised for the act of lying. They're praised for other things surrounding that, not the lying itself. And we covered Calvin's interpretation of Exodus 1 as an example of a Reformed thinker on this. And as we mentioned, or as I mentioned, I guess, the Reformed tradition is nearly unanimous on this. And it's, it's, it's not something that's small potatoes. I mean, it's very consistent witness on this matter of interpretation. Number two, I received somebody, Doug Ponder, I think it was, who said, no, 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 no. It's a category mistake to to think that this is a lie. It's not lying. And then he referenced John Frame and his definition of lying where John Frame says, the sin of false witness is that of distorting the facts. And here's the key way, key phrase, in such a way as to harm one's neighbor. But that is a very mistaken understanding of what the the basic definition of lying is. Lying may have intentions to harm one's neighbor, but it's just a matter of distorting the facts. So I wrote an essay, I don't know how many years ago, about sermon plagiarism, saying sermon plagiarism is bad. We go give that example once again and say, you know what? The intention for sermon plagiarism and lying about your own work is for the benefit of, of others. It's not to harm anyone. And so then would we want to say that sermon plagiarism is good? It's not lying. No, we, of course we wouldn't say that. It's, it is absolutely lying, even without that condition. So the, the harming one's neighbor is neither necessary nor sufficient for it to be a lie. And that's just the way it is. So it is still a lie. It's a different type of lie. If you look at the categories that are offered in the tradition, very consistent, those three different types of lies, they're all categorized as lies. Now, are they, they have differing degrees of seriousness, and different people will differ on whether certain types of lies are culpable or not. The Reformed tradition, by and large, though, almost exclusively says all of the categories are indeed sins against God, just as Turretin says, just as Bavink says. And the last thing, I watched a Matt Walsh video just before this, and that's why I was like, you know what, I want to say something additional to this. 
because it just made me think. I mean, I'm watching this, and I haven't watched his his documentary or whatever. I probably won't. Maybe I will. I don't know. But this, that's what started the whole brouhaha was the documentary and then the, the sort of criticism that you're using underhanded tactics to make this deceit. And whether he did or not, I don't know. But it seems, watching that video, it seemed evident that he basically admitted that he did and that that was the only way to actually humiliate and expose these people. But as I think about it, I, like, are we unable to make a compelling argument against DEI and other things without resorting to deception? Or is the true reality that we don't want arguments, we want entertainment? And the only way to get actual entertainment is to deceive and to lie. That's what it seemed like Matt Walsh was saying, and that's unfortunate. Um, I think he probably does a lot of good things, a lot of, says a lot of things, great things. I don't know. I don't watch him in any regular fashion, so I, I really can't comment authoritatively or even, I don't know, <laughs> informed other than something like this. I watched this video, and I just thought the reasoning here is rather sad and pathetic in a lot of ways. And he, you know, he starts whining about criticism from, from people who are on his team and on the right or whatever, like get some thicker skin. Like that, that's part of what the, the intellectual enterprise is supposed to be is to criticize each other and to, to, to find areas that you've failed and you, you've, you've done wrong and say, you know what? Yeah, maybe I, I, I failed in that area. Maybe I'm totally wrong here. Maybe I've misunderstood something and that, that shouldn't be, perceived as some sort of like evil against one another. That's just that truly, you know, he, he didn't like the terminology of iron sharpens iron, but that's, that's just what the intellectual enterprise is. And I guess when you're just a media personality and you're not actually in true intellectual discourse where competing opinions and ideas are supposed to sharpen one another, then you may actually think that that's not possible. So my advice would be to get into some more of those spaces and to realize that it actually is for the benefit of you. But that's another topic. I just wanted to note those three main things. Number one, um, no one in scripture is praised for lying. Number two, it's not a category mistake. It is a lie. It's just a different type of lie, and that's okay. Uh, there are different categories of lies, and that's just across the, the Christian tradition. You see everybody making these same sort of buckets or distinctions. Uh, so Frame is just simply wrong here. Frame is wrong on a, on, a, on a host of things. I like John Frame, but he's he's got some mistakes in there. And then the other piece was the Matt Walsh thing. of you know, He basically said it's necessary to deceive and lie to it in order to get this. And I think that's just ridiculous. Maybe it is necessary to get this sort of entertainment shock factor that you wanted in, in the video. But I don't think that's necessary to make a compelling case or a compelling argument. And if you think it is, then we're in a very sorry state. Okay, that's it for now. Thanks for tuning in. Hopefully this additional piece was useful in some way. I appreciate you all tuning in, and I look forward to thinking with you all soon.